Ohio, birthplace of Thomas Edison, NBA star LeBron James, seven U.S. presidents, and me. Hi, I'm Shannon Rice, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN. And this week, Lectures in History travels to Akron, Ohio. Ohio has been called by historians the, quote, mother of presidents. And University of Akron professor Kevin Kern discusses those seven Ohioans who have served as president between the years of 1868 and 1920. Those presidents are Ulysses Grant, Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield, Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley, William Howard Taft, and Warren G. Harding. More on the birthplace of many of our nation's presidents after this. It's good to see you here today. Uh, today, uh, we've been talk- we're going to be talking about the Ohio dynasty of U.S. presidents. And as we've already discussed, Ohio had been moving from the periphery to the center of U.S. politics before the Civil War, and then, of course, played a central leadership role in that war itself. And this trend is going to continue after the war in one of the most remarkable political dynasties in U.S. history, one that's often been compared to the Virginia dynasty of the early republic. Both Virginia and Ohio have laid claim to the mother of presidents title, even to the point of fighting over poor old William Henry Harrison and all of his 30 days in office. But even taking old Tippecanoe out of the equation, I'm not really sure it's a fair fight. Uh, I mean, for example, the Virginia dynasty has some of the most famous and influential presidents in U.S. history, including the likes of Washington and Jefferson and Madison. Ohio, on the other hand, has a bunch of beardy guys that no one seems to remember or know much about. Seriously, anyone here want to try picking these guys out of a lineup? Uh, so, yeah, you've got, I think we got McKinley. Nope. See, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about, and that's fine. I, 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 that's the way it is. And, and so for, for that reason, I don't think that it's productive or instructive to fight over some unofficial title of the mother of presidents. Rather, I think the Ohio dynasty of presidents has some much more meaningful things to say about Ohio and its role in U.S. history that is not really reflected in just counting the number of presidents. In fact, as we'll see, it goes far beyond just the presidents. As we've discussed, historians tend to be much more interested in the whys of history than the whats of history. And I think that's where the more meaningful importance lies. So, for example, right off the bat, we should examine how historians have viewed the Ohio presidents. Every few years or so, historians engage in a kind of navel-gazing exercise where they rank the U.S. presidents from best to worst. And while these rankings often say as much or more about the historians doing the ranking than they do about the presidents they rank, uh, they can be quite indicative of the way people perceive the president. So, for example, here you have the rankings of the Virginia dynasty and uh, the Ohio, the heart of the Ohio dynasty. Uh, you can see Virginia does very well. Blue means the top 25 percent. Green is the next 25 percent. Yellow is the below average 25 percent. And orange, you don't want to be orange. All right, so look at Virginia. Lots and lots of blue and greens. Uh, Ohio, not so much. Uh, there's a lot of yellow and orange in there for most of them. And there are some reasons for this, and we'll see them, but there are other factors at play here that go up beyond the specific actions of these guys. So, for example, what we consider to be the standards of a good president has changed over the years. Nowadays, we tend to look at our presidents to be people who are strong and forceful leaders. But back in the days right after the Civil War, there was a consensus among many people that people like Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Jackson had overstepped their bounds. They had gone too far. And that the proper role of a president was to execute the laws but not tread on the purview of the legislative branch. And so by those standards, the standards of that time, most of these guys were doing exactly what they should have been doing, according to that line of thought, by not being too forceful and respecting the boundaries of the executive and legislative branches. So this might help explain the way Ohio presidents have fared in historical rankings. But as we'll see, some of those rankings can change over time. So let's talk about Ohio and national politics in the post-Civil War period, starting with The White House. It is truly an era 
of political influence almost unprecedented in U.S. history by any objective standard. From 1868 to 1900, there were nine presidential elections. 68, 72, 76, 80, 84, 88, 92, 96, 1900. An Ohioan was one of the two major candidates in all but one of those elections. The sole exception was the election of 1884. The two candidates were from New York and Maine. But even in that one, the guy who won was named Cleveland. So there's kind of an Ohio connection, right? No, not really. Uh, In any case, going eight for nine and electing five different men to the presidency is an extraordinary streak, matched only by Virginia from Washington to Monroe in the early days of the Republic. Add to this the fact that Ohioans alternated among the next four presidents with William Howard Taft following Teddy Roosevelt and Warren Harding following Woodrow Wilson. This makes seven presidents over a little more than 50 years. And in 1920, you had no choice. You had to vote for Ohio. You could vote either for Harding or for Ohio Democrat James Cox, pictured here with his running mate that year, some guy named Roosevelt. So to appreciate these presidents, we first need to understand what the main political issues were at the time. And these are mostly very different than the issues that animate current political discourse. For example, there were still lingering issues from the Civil War during most of this period. One of the main ones had to do with the question of how to protect protect the civil rights of the freedmen in the South, even as southern state governments and vigilante groups like the Ku Klux Klan tried to strip them away. Also, Union veterans during this period were constantly lobbying for the expansion of pensions for themselves and their families. And in general, Republicans tended to advocate for these measures, often engaging in something called waving the bloody shirt, painting their Democratic opponents as being the party of rebellion and post-war brutality. Another huge issue of the time was what to do with the U.S. currency. During the war, the U.S. issued paper money, but many pro-business people wanted to enshrine the gold standard as the only basis of U.S. money. Others advocated for the continued use of paper money or the addition of silver to gold, which would expand the money supply and make it easier for people to get credit. While Republicans tended to favor the gold standard and Democrats tended to favor silver, there were minorities of gold Democrats and silver Republicans. Throughout most of the 1800s, there had been a constant debate over how high or low tariffs should be. Businessmen, factory owners, and often factory workers liked high tariffs because they protected American industry and jobs from foreign competition. Farmers and rural people tended to favor lower tariffs because high tariffs made manufactured goods more expensive and reduced foreign demand for agricultural products. As such, the Republicans tended to favor high tariffs. Democrats tended to want them low. Something that seemed to be increasingly a big problem in the late 1800s was the effect that the spoil system of political patronage was having on government. Many people began advocating for civil service reform that would give government jobs to people based on merit rather than which politician was doling out the favors. Although this was a very popular issue, the system was so deeply entrenched in both parties that it would take a major disruptive event to get meaningful reform here. Lastly, in part because the politicians of both parties seemed to be wedded to this system and averse to meaningful reform, some people began to create more grassroots movements to try to force change through popular action. This flourished in the late 1800s as the populist movement, which eventually formed a national party and ran presidential candidates in 1892 and endorsed a candidate in 1896. It also uh, took the form of things like the so-called Coxey's Army, a march on Washington by hundreds of unemployed people led by a masculine Ohio businessman named Jacob Coxey in 1894 during a severe depression that started the previous year. They were demanding that the government ease employment by hiring men for public works projects and paying them in paper currency to expand the money supply. Although the protest actually ended up fizzling when they reached Washington, they got to the Capitol and they were arrested for walking on the grass. 
That's a kind of ignominious end for this. The march was emblematic of the discontent of the period and was significant for being the first major popular protest march on Washington in U.S. history. Now, I know it is really hard for us to imagine nowadays people arguing till they're blue in the face with veins bulging out of their foreheads over free coinage of silver or lower the tariff. But you got to understand These were the hot-button issues of the day, and they could win or lose elections. So let's talk about how the Ohio presidents fit into this context and actually help advance some of these issues. Uh, The first of these presidents uh, from this, this period of time is, of course, Ulysses Grant. And we've already discussed his background when we we talked about him in the Civil War. Uh, We we learned, of course, that he was a really great general. Not really such a great president, though. Uh, In fact, he ended up running what is objectively one of the most corrupt administrations in U.S. history. Now, I want to make it very clear. Grant himself was not corrupt. Grant was not on the take. Grant was not profiting from this corruption. Grant's fault is that he had terrible taste in friends. He would appoint his friends to office, and his friends took advantage of his trust and uh, got into all kinds of trouble. And there were a number of scandals during the Grant administration. One of the most famous was the whiskey ring, where whiskey producers bribed government officials to evade liquor taxes. There's a New York Customs House scandal. Uh, The New York Customs House was by far the most important and profitable uh, uh, from the port of New York in in the United States. Uh, And government appointees who ran this were skimming money from merchants and getting money under the table. The Star Route Ring. Uh, The government gave out Western uh, mail routes to subcontractors who in turn made money by charging fees or charging for routes. They just made up, just routes that didn't exist. Do you have a question? Was this before the uh, the teapot dome scandal? Oh, yeah, that's uh, that's Harding. Yeah, Harding also ran a very corrupt administration and also for the same reason. He had very, very bad taste in friends. Did Grant bring a lot of military friends, or was it mostly he went to D.C. and D.C. sort of... Well, yeah, I think part of it was that uh, it wasn't so much like Harding. Harding had the Ohio gang. Uh, he, he made a lot of friends through his uh, role as a general. And so uh, these friends were outside, necessarily, Ohio. But yes, uh, he, he, he did just... And he stood by them until they really, really uh, screwed him for this. So... And, and these are just a few of the scandals. Uh, there were many more. Uh, and as a result of this, for many years, Grant was ranked among the very worst presidents ever. However, a funny thing has happened to Grant in, uh, in the eyes of historians. More recently, there has been a reappraisal of the significance of his presidency. Yes, it was the most scandal-ridden uh, to that point in history. But there were also some of his actions that loomed large in a better way. He helped create Yellowstone National Park, the first uh, official national park. He oversaw the passage and enactment of the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed the right to vote to African Americans. He implemented the Enforcement Acts, which Congress passed to enforce the 15th Amendment and protect African Americans from actions of groups like the Ku Klux Klan. And he vigorously enforced these laws and effectively disrupted the Klan in the South. With this, and with his enforcement of the 14th and 15th Amendments, Grant did more to protect and defend the civil rights of African Americans than any other president for almost a century, until you get to the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. He was also a genuinely nice guy. He was an amiable man who was willing to admit his mistakes. Uh, In fact, despite what you may have heard recently, U.S. Grant was the first U.S. president to be arrested. He was arrested for speeding. He loved horses, he loved to race his carriage, and a cop literally pulled him over in 1872. Now, what does he do? Does he say, do you know who I am? No. He said, no, you got me fair and square. He laughs, he smiles, he pays the fine, he acknowledged his fault. 
Uh, and it's hard not to like someone who does that. In fact, he, at the very end of his administration, he publicly apologized for his administration. Some historians think every president should publicly apologize for their administration, but he's the only one to actually do it. So taking all this into consideration, look at what has happened to his view in the eye of historians. He, orange, he's very, very orange. But then, about 20 years ago, opinion seems to shift. And more recent ones, including a couple that were commissioned by C-SPAN in 2017 and 2021, have moved him up from terrible all the way right up to meh. And, you know, okay, maybe that's nothing to brag about, but it is an unprecedented reappraisal among presidents. While a number of presidents have moved up or down a quartile or so, only Grant, among all U.S. presidents, has moved from being consistently uh, the worst category to being regularly put into the above average category. Do you think recent documentaries have had an effect on this rating? Yeah, and also uh, recent uh, biographies of, of him. And, and this is, again, a shift of opinion. People realize, yeah, he had scandals, but here's a guy who was actually standing up for civil rights you know, 100 years before uh, it, it became really uh, uh, something that most people were, were on board with. Okay, so there's Grant. Grant leaves office. The Republicans know that uh, they are tainted by scandal. They need to elect somebody or nominate somebody who is above reproach. And they find that guy with this guy, Rutherford Burchard Hayes. Uh, Hayes was born in southern Ohio. Uh, he went to Kenyon College. He graduated from Harvard Law, became a lawyer in what is now Fremont, Ohio. Uh, he was a reformer. His wife was a reformer. And when the Civil War started, he joined up as a major of the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry. He saw a lot of action. He was wounded five times, but kept returning and ended the war as a breveted major general. He was nominated to Congress while the war was still going on, but he refused to campaign, saying, and he is quoting him, an officer fit for duty who at this crisis would abandon his post to electioneer for a seat in Congress ought to be scalped. And that was all the campaigning he did, and that was all the campaigning he needed to do. He was elected, uh, but he didn't really like Congress that much, and he returned to Ohio and served as a very popular governor for three terms. He's the first Ohio governor to be elected three times. And he gets elected as a Republican at times when Democrats actually end up taking the state house. Uh, this is, shows his popularity transcended just the, uh, his Republican base. Uh, so he, and he, again, he's very scrupulous. He's, uh, beyond reproach. Uh, there, there are no skeletons in his closet. Unfortunately, his presidency was uh, limited even before he took the oath of office, and a lot of that had to do with the way he became president. The infamous election of 1876, uh, this is, despite what you may have heard, uh, the most uh, uh, controversial election in U.S. history. Uh, the election happens in November Samuel Tilden, the New York uh, Democrat, looks like he's won. He's won the popular vote by a quarter of a million votes. He has all but one of the electoral votes he needs to become president, but there are 19 contested electoral votes in Louisiana, Florida, South Carolina, and Georgia. Uh, and so uh, these contested votes, they, they're debating over this. November turns to December, turns to January, turns to February. Finally, there's this big electoral commission uh, and then they vote along party lines to award each and every single one of the contested uh, electoral votes to Hayes. Uh, and so a lot of people cried foul. A lot of people said that he was unfairly put into the office. Uh, and again, this is right up until they, they took the oath of office in March in those days. Right up until early March, they weren't 100 percent sure who was going to take the oath of office. So. His presidency is already tainted by this, and they, were, they kept referring to him as Rutherford B. Hayes or, or his fraudulency. And this is really going to limit his effectiveness. Another thing that limits his effectiveness is that he says pretty much early on that he's not going to run for re-election. He's only going to serve one term. Uh, and he does this for a very admirable reasons. He says, this way I can do what I feel is right. I don't have to make a plan to do something thinking about whether it will help or hurt me in the next election. 
And that's very noble. But at the same time, it means he enters office as a lame duck. Everybody knows he's not going to run again. And therefore, they don't really feel they need to play ball with him. And then in his first year, there's a nationwide rail strike. He comes down uh, uh, on the side of management by sending in federal troops uh, to, uh, to, to police this strike. And this makes him very unpopular with a lot of people. Uh, so, uh, again, all of these things are happening even before he's president. And he really does not uh, uh, look like a, uh, he's going to be a very effective president. This is not to say he doesn't do some good stuff. He does uh, appoint uh, people based on merit to governor, uh, government offices. He appoints reformers to his cabinet. He tries to clean up the New York Customs House. In fact, he nominates a young man named Theodore Roosevelt to, uh, to replace uh, Chester Arthur, who was kind of the corrupt uh, head of the Customs House. He blocks uh, Roscoe Conkling, who was a big Republican boss in New York. Uh, he... Uh, he does things uh, which he thinks are, are, are the right thing to do. Uh, but again, uh, he's tainted by all of this other stuff. And so he, when he leaves office, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of under a cloud. Uh, on the other hand, Ruther B. Hayes is the second most famous U.S. president in Paraguay. Uh, and I'm not making this up. Paraguay uh, was in the middle of a war with Argentina, and they decided to stop fighting and have the United States president arbitrate the dispute. And uh, Hayes' administration arbitrates this dispute in the favor of Paraguay and awards a whole bunch of land to Paraguay. And they love him for it. In fact, they name a city after him. They name one of their states, they, they, uh, they, they, they call it a department, uh, there is the state of Presidente Hayes in, in Paraguay. Uh, even a major soccer club, Club Presidente Hayes, uh, is named after him. So, I mean, he's got that going for him, right? Uh, of course, Hayes isn't going to run. Uh, the Republicans have to find someone else. Uh, they go back to the well by nominating uh, uh, James Abram Garfield. And I think... Garfield is one of the great it, what ifs if in U.S. presidential history. He was very smart. He was a strong leader. He was our nation's only ambidextrous president. He could write equally well with uh, right and left hand. Uh, he comes from. He's like a, a story out of a book. He, a very humble beginnings, raised in poverty. His father dies when he's very young. For a while, at age sixteen, he drives a mule on the Ohio and Erie Canal. Uh, his life was a literal rags-to-riches story. And I mean that literally. Horatio Alger, who's famous for writing all these rags-to-riches stories in the 1800s, wrote Garfield's campaign biography, From Canal Boy to President. Uh, this is a guy who, uh, even though he is, uh, comes from a very poor family, he enrolls in the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute. This eventually becomes what we know as Hiram uh, University over here in Portage County. Uh, he actually started out supporting his studies by serving as a janitor there, but within two years, he himself is actually teaching some of the students there. And then he goes on, uh, graduates from Williams College out east, but comes back and serves as principal, uh, gets involved uh, in politics. Uh, when the uh, Civil War comes along, uh, he ends up uh, serving, uh, actually starting, actually, his own unit, the 42nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry. He rises up to Major General before he comes back to serve in Congress. He became a major figure in the Republican delegation. He befriends Ohio, very influential Ohio Senator John Sherman. And so when Hayes refused to run again, Garfield went to the Republican convention in Chicago to try to get the nomination for Sherman. He's out there advocating for Sherman. But he gets up and he gives a stemwinder of a speech. And people say, ooh, I like the cut of his jib. I, I like this guy. And they start voting for Garfield. And Garfield says, no, 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 I'm not running. And, and he's gaveled out of order and his friends are just kind of trying to hold him down. The thing is, you have the stalwarts. Stalwarts like the old spoil system. They like the corrupt system, and they wanted to nominate Grant again. And the Republicans knew that was probably a bad idea. 
Uh, Garfield actually had a much better reputation, uh, the, and since the convention was deadlocked, one by one, people started flocking to him, and he ends up getting the nomination. But they end up putting his running mate as uh, Chester Allen Arthur, who had been you know, kicked out of the New York Customs House because he was a stalwart, and they wanted to placate the stalwart faction, and that would be a fateful choice. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much to say about his presidency because it was so short. He did uh, uh, appoint a lot of African Americans to office, uh, which uh, is something that was was part of that idea of advancing civil rights for African Americans, including Frederick Douglass. He gives Frederick Douglass a, a federal job. Uh, he advocates for civil service reform. Uh, in fact, he stands up to Roscoe Conkling. Roscoe Conkling, actually, you know, this this big corrupt Republican boss in New York, he ends up falling as a result of the actions of Garfield. And in the end, he was probably the president most to credit for meaningful civil service reform, but not in the way he would have chosen. In a train station on the way to a college reunion, uh, Garfield is going to the platform and an insane man who was a disappointed office seeker, a guy named Charles Guiteau, uh, shoots him twice from behind. And sadly, Garfield probably would have been okay if the doctors had just left him alone. But no, they kept poking and prodding him with unsterilized instruments and even their fingers trying to find out where the bullet is. Uh, And so he gets badly infected and he lingers for months uh, before dying. Uh, And although this, of course, is undeniably tragic, Garfield's death may actually have been his biggest contribution to American politics. The shocking nature of a presidential assassination by a disappointed office seeker built a groundswell of support for civil service reform. And in its wake, Ohio Democrat George Pendleton proposed the Pendleton Civil Service Act, which creates the modern U.S. civil service. The next election was 1884, the only one that didn't feature an Ohioan, but even this was instructive. The Republicans chose a guy named James G. Blaine, who was not from Ohio and did not serve in the Civil War, and they lost to Cleveland. The GOP would not make that mistake again for the rest of the century. So uh, next, the election of 1888, uh, they settle on Benjamin Harrison. He's born and raised in Ohio. He is the grandson of William Henry Harrison. He graduated from Miami in Oxford, uh, set up a practice, a law practice in Indianapolis. Then he joins the Civil War as a captain, finishes as a brevet uh, brigadier general, rises in a national politics, and in the 1888 Republican Convention, he checked all the requisite boxes. Are you from Ohio? Check. Did you serve in the Civil War? Check. Okay, you're our guy. He also had the advantage of his pedigree, uh, and in the subsequent election, the Republicans sold him as much or more as uh, the, uh, from his relationship to his grandpa, William Henry Harrison, as they, they did for his own merits. And although, like Hayes, he lost the popular vote, he did win the Electoral College. And for the first time since 1875, the Republican Party controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency, and they set to work passing an ambitious agenda which included a lot of spending. He inherited a surplus from Cleveland, but upon his election, one of his supporters cried, Harrison is president, and God help the surplus. And... He was absolutely right. He oversaw a dramatic increase in pension spending, over $160 million a year just for those pensions. He also greatly expanded the U.S. Navy, paving the way for the U.S. to have a true two-ocean Navy. And because of this and other things, he presided over what became known as the Billion Dollar Congress, the first time Congress had spent that much money in peacetime. And although he claimed to support civil service reform, there were too many political debts he had to pay for such a narrow victory. So right after he gets in office, they end up firing 35,000 Democrats from their uh, civil service jobs, uh, replace them with Republicans, and then slap civil service protections in, which is exactly the opposite of the way civil service is supposed to work. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, he does uh, preside over the passage of some really important legislation. The McKinley Tariff of 1890, uh, uh, penned by William McKinley, also from Ohio, we'll talk about him in a minute, uh, raises protective tariffs to their highest rate to that point. 
the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, the anti-monopoly legislation, which is still the law of the land today, was passed uh, under him, and he signed that. The Sherman Silver Purchase Act, which was an attempt to expand the currency, that was also under Harrison, and both of those laws were uh, drafted by John Sherman of Ohio. Uh, One of the biggest, most lasting effects of Harrison's presidency was the admission of a whole bunch of new states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Washington, Idaho, Wyoming. All of these states were brought in by the Republicans in some ways to counter the fact that the South could reliably count on the solid South to vote Democratic. They were hoping to uh, admit a whole bunch of uh, states from the Northwest that would help be reliably Republican and help balance that uh, solid South. Still, when it comes time for his reelection, some of his political rivals in the GOP didn't really like him because he didn't play ball with them. They didn't support him. The economy slowed down. And the massive spending that happened during his term was a big turnoff for a lot of voters. Here's a political cartoon from the time. Here he, he inherits this $100 million surplus. He's, he's kind of shabby there. Uh, and when he leaves four years later, he's all spiffy with you know, spats and a nice walking cane. And, uh, of course, the U.S. Treasury uh, has no surplus anymore. Uh, and he loses in that rematch with Cleveland. Uh, Also in 1892, uh, the governor of Ohio, uh, William McKinley, uh, writes down that he intends to be elected president in 1896. Uh, And it was prophetic. Uh, William McKinley uh, was indeed uh, elected in 1896 and may be, uh, I think, the most consequential of all the Ohio dynasty of presidents. How you feel about William McKinley as a president probably depends in part on how you feel about imperialism because he presided over the Spanish-American War and the beginnings of American empire. Uh, And uh, this is going to be his legacy for, for better or for worse. But his legacy goes beyond that. Uh, uh, William McKinley was born in Northeast Ohio, in Niles, Ohio. Uh, He joins the Civil War, signs right up at age 18, uh, actually in the uh, 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry, which uh, Rutherford Hayes commanded. Uh, And he serves with distinction throughout the Civil War, uh, rising all the way from private to a major, which is a pretty big promotion, set of promotions. Uh, And he serves uh, with distinction. He serves under heavy fire. Uh, He is there at Antietam. In fact, if you go to the Antietam battlefield, you will see a monument to McKinley. Uh, And uh, the park ranger who was taking me around when I took this picture uh, pointed to that monument and said, you know, this is probably the only monument on any battlefield anywhere in the world that is dedicated to a commissary officer. What's a commissary officer? Yeah, provides food, coffee. So he, he was in charge of getting supplies to the soldiers. And now, I'm not saying that this uh, discounts his bravery. He was doing that under heavy fire. But that's what he was doing. He was getting coffee to the front lines, uh, and he could have very easily uh, uh, been hurt by this. So... Uh, uh, so there you have, and of course this was put up later, uh, but yeah, this does show uh, his, how much people admired him at the time. So was that his major role throughout the war and how he ranked up? Through- well, he ranked up, he eventually ended up being an aide to uh, some of the officers. He, 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 I'm not saying he, he spent the whole, uh, whole, whole war serving coffee, no. <clears throat> I think you answered my question, but you said that was put up after he became president? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a lot of monuments were put up for him after he became president uh, because he, as we'll ter- find out, he was probably the most popular Ohio president of all uh, because of a lot of things that happened during uh, his administration. And so uh, we'll talk about those, but you can argue that McKinley is as important for the presidency by things he did before he became president, as he is for what happened after he became president. And that's because the election of 1896 is one that historians point to as being really the first modern 
U.S. presidential election. Electioneering back in the 1800s was very different than it is today. Uh, in fact, you didn't really even have one national campaign. Uh, the, the, the party in each state essentially ran the campaign. So there would be an Ohio campaign for the Republican nominee or a New York campaign for the Republican nominee. Uh, the McKinley campaign, thanks to his uh, close friendship with a financier and, and industrialist up in uh, Cleveland named Marcus Hanna, uh, really brought modern campaign uh, politics to the United States. Uh, they, they used polling for the first time. They, they polled different messages and tailored their messages to uh, different communities. So in one area, he's going to sell this. In this, th- another area, he's going to sell this idea. Uh, direct mail. They sent out millions and millions of pieces of direct mail. This was new. No one had ever done this before. Uh, they also spent a ton of money. If you want to look at the election that really started the trend for spending tons of money on presidential elections, the McKinley election uh, of 1896 was the big election in this that set that precedent. Now, I, I seem to remember reading about how it was still sort of frowned upon, like you were too much of a tryhard if you were campaigning exactly. everywhere, right? So he was on his front porch in Canton, essentially. Right, and so here's the thing. The, the, the person who really broke that was his opponent, William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan ran the first whistle-stop campaign where he actually went out to the people, traveled thousands and thousands of miles across the United States. So that's also part of the first modern presidential campaign, a candidate actually going out. McKinley didn't want to do this. First of all, his wife had health issues. He, he did not want to leave her. He, he was such a good, doting husband on his wife. Uh, so he didn't want to leave her. Also, William Jennings Bryan was known as a very, very good orator. He felt he would suffer by comparison. So what happens is they set up this front porch campaign where they w- if he can't go to the voters, they're going to bring the voters to him. They load hundreds of thousands of people on special trains that come into Canton. They get off the train. They march to his front porch. He comes out on the front porch. He's already been briefed on who these people are, where they're from, what their main issues are. He's like, oh, well, look, we have these people here. Oh, well, by the way, let me talk to you about tariffs, you know. Uh, And that was how uh, he got his message across. And and this was very, very effective. And you can do that when you have a lot of money to spend. And so uh, when the election is actually, and he really sells the idea of uh, of gold. He is a gold bug. He really believes uh, in the gold standard. Uh, and uh, uh, William Jennings Bryan is a big advocate of the free coinage of silver. And again, this is where people were literally getting knocked down, drag out fights over gold, silver, gold. Uh, he is uh, uh, really, really big on actually the, the tariff. That, that is what he really wants. But he is the, the, uh, the gold peep faction in the Republican Party. Uh, say, you, you got you to gotta sell gold. And say, so, OK, I'm going to sell gold. But he's really into tariffs. That, that's, his, uh, that's his jam, you know. Uh, And so when the votes are counted, uh, McKinley wins by a relatively comfortable margin, which is very, very unusual at the time. And that's why, and this is another significance of McKinley, before he even takes the oath of office, the election of 1896 is called by many historians uh, one of the few realignment elections in U.S. history, where things have been going along for a while, and then one candidate or the other shifts a significant number of people over to Uh, that party and breaks that cycle. That's what McKinley did. McKinley was able to peel away a lot of immigrant working class voters from the Democratic Party. Democrats had a a big base of immigrant working class voters. Uh, McKinley is able to sell uh, things like the tariffs. Hey, this if we have high tariffs, that's going to mean you get uh, you you have better jobs. Uh, You were, were protecting American labor. Uh, And so this really did uh, shift the balance, whereas previous elections, uh, all the elections that we'll see were really closely contested from the uh, mid-1800s to 1892. 1896 breaks that trend. And then when he runs for re-election four years later, it is is an even bigger uh, majority. What are some of the other realignment campaigns? Oh, uh, 1830, I'm sorry, 1932, the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Uh, the Reagan election in 1980 starts this uh, uh, with the Reagan Democrats coming over, things like that. 
Uh, but this is one of the, the, the more important ones. So he has already made history before he takes the oath of office. And, and if, if he did nothing other than those things, he would be considered to be a significant figure in presidential history. But of course, he did other things as well. He was president. Uh, and so he is um, someone, again, as, like I said, who presides over the creation of American empire. He is the person... Uh, who annexes Hawaii. This is the reason why uh, we have Hawaii. He annexed Hawaii. He was the one who presided over the Spanish-American War. Uh, And it should be said, uh, uh, he was in many ways a reluctant imperialist. He wasn't, he was kind of on the fence about this. There were a lot of people in his own party who were pushing him, go to war with Spain, go to war with Spain. And he was actually kind of holding back for a while. He wanted all the, you know, facts to get in. Eventually he decides he will uh, go to war uh, with Spain. And as Teddy Roosevelt uh, said, uh, the, uh, the, the Spanish-American war, at least from the American perspective, was a splendid little war. Didn't last too long. American casualties were relatively few. And, of course, the United States gets an empire. It gets Puerto Rico. It gets the Philippines. It gets Guam. And now Ohio, and Ohio, <laughs> now the United States is an imperial power along with uh, countries like Great Britain and France and, and, and Germany. Uh, and so when he runs for re-election in, in 1900, the economy has rebounded. The, uh, the United States has won a war. Uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the U.S. is now a major player uh, in international politics. Here's this prosperity at home, prestige abroad. Uh, and he has a rematch with William Jennings Bryan and just creams him, just crushes him. It, it is a, uh, it's a landslide victory and, again, shows this shift, this realignment uh, that had happened. And so he is, again, super popular as he takes office in 1901, but he doesn't get to enjoy it very long, as you probably, a spoiler alert, uh, there, uh, there's, there's going to be some bloodshed here. Uh, because uh, he goes to the Pan American Exposition in uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, a, a fellow Ohioan, a guy named Leon Shalgosh, uh, an anarchist who was an uh, uh, industrial worker in Cleveland. He has a heavily bandaged hand and goes up to shake. And, and, he, and uh, McKinley loves shaking hands. He would do that all day. He loves shaking hands. But he doesn't know what to do with this guy who has this heavily bandaged hand. Well, it's heavily bandaged because he's concealing a gun. And at close range, he pumps two bullets into him. And uh, McKinley falls back mortally wounded. But again, to show just how much a nice guy he was, people loved him for the way he treated his wife. People loved him just for the way he treated other people. And so here he is. He's mortally wounded. The people, the Secret Service agents, other people grab Leon Shalgas, and they're just beating the crap out of him. And here is the president of the United States, mortally wounded by this guy. He yells out to the guys, go easy on him, fellas. Wow. What a nice guy, right? Uh, again, if they had just freaking left him alone, he probably would have been okay. But no, they're still trying to poke and prod. Uh, and, uh, and in the end, he ends up dying of an infection. And he dies as probably the most popular assassinated president ever. People forget that Kennedy was not super popular when he was assassinated. Lincoln was not super popular when he was assassinated. McKinley was, had just won in a landslide, which helps explain, I think, the way he gets memorialized. Uh, they, the children from all over the country literally contributed their pennies uh, to build the McKinley Memorial down in Canton. Uh, schools are named after him, and, and uh, this is, uh, again, uh, probably the high point of the Ohio dynasty of, of presidents. Uh, so, okay, so that takes us from 1868 to 1900. Kind of on the same premises as Manifest Destiny is like that the the reason. Yeah, certainly there was some of that uh, rationale going on there. So uh, when we were talking about Ohio when it was first getting started, there was like not a a lot of money, not a lot of currency. Um, I'm surprised that the gold standard idea had 
enough sway compared to silver, whereas there's a lot well, more. Well, certainly rural Ohioans supported silver, but Ohio is also a major industrial state at this time. The, the, the currency issues of the early 1800s really weren't a factor by the well, late 1800s. I'm talking more like nationwide. It's just interesting to me that gold kind of won the argument over silver. Like, I would have expected silver, I guess, to yeah, win. Yeah, again, it depends on who you are. If you're an industrial worker, you want gold because that protects your job. And, of course, industrial workers were more and more of the population as, as time go- went on. So uh, if it were just those Ohio presidents, that would be an impressive dynasty for Ohio. But it wasn't just presidents, was it? Uh, Ohioans played a major role in all branches of government. Uh, they served in a number of important cabinet positions. These are just uh, the, the cabinet positions Just from Lincoln to McKinley, all these major uh, treasury and attorney general and state and war, uh, all these people from Ohio. Uh, Also, the Supreme Court. Salmon P. Chase was chief justice uh, until 1873, and then he's replaced by a Toledo uh, lawyer named Morrison Waite, who then serves for another 14 years. So the chief justice of the United States for most of this period is from Ohio. And, of course, some of the associate justices, as you can read in your book, are also from Ohio as well. Uh, So the uh, executive branch, check. Judicial branch, check. Legislative branch, John Sherman, Ben Wade were some of the most influential uh, senators uh, leading the uh, uh, Reconstruction efforts and, and leading the country through the war. John Bingham from Ohio actually wrote the 14th Amendment. George Pendleton, as we've seen, a Democrat from uh, Cincinnati, ends up writing the uh, Civil Service uh, Act. So the question, though, is not, okay, so there's a whole bunch of guys from Ohio. So what? Well, the question is really why. Why Ohio? And that is actually a really important question, the one I really want you to take away from this. Not that there are a bunch of Ohio presidents, but why Ohio? And we've already talked about a lot of these issues that are probably uh, responsible for this. First, uh, demographics. We've already talked about this. We've seen how Ohio rose to become the third largest state in the country by the 1840s. So just by sheer force of numbers, the state would have had a leg up. But this alone can't explain it all. New York and Pennsylvania had more people, uh, but they didn't have the same record. What else is true about Ohio's uh, population, where it comes from? It's not just how many, it's where they're from. As we've seen, Ohio was the first state carved out of the public land system, and Ohio drew its population from all over the country, Northeasterners, Mid-Atlantic, Southerners. They funneled into the state. And Ohio also drew overseas immigrants from places like Germany and Ireland. So as one historian has said, Ohio was as near a microcosm of America as one could find in the late 19th century. And as such, it becomes an important swing state whose state and congressional delegation could flip between democratically controlled and Republican controlled in any given election. Another thing Ohio has going for it is its economic profile. Ohio is also a microcosm of the country as a whole economically. Already a major agricultural state by the 1800s, Ohio also became a major industrial state by mid-century, as we've already seen. So, coming from a state with such a diverse and representative population and economy, a successful politician from Ohio would need to be able to relate to and speak to the interests of multiple constituencies, including multiple ethnic groups, labor, management, farmers, rural voters, urban voters, and more. In other words, the same skills a politician would need to be successful in the nation as a whole. Another factor is the legacy of the Civil War. As we've seen, Ohio had moved from the periphery to the center of the U.S. economically and politically in the years before the Civil War, but the war itself reinforced these developments. And as we've also seen, Ohio played a critical war role in the war, both in terms of military and political leadership. So it's no coincidence that all five of, all of these five U.S. Uh, Ohio presidents in the 1800s served in the war. Um, because Ohio was like so actively involved in the Civil War, did they have a lot of like hardliners in like Reconstruction? Yeah, uh, people like Ben Wade were some of the, the, the hardest hardliners, the, the radical Republicans. Yeah, absolutely. And Bingham, too, uh, as we talked about. So there's another factor that explains it. Another factor. Can anyone guess what that other factor is? 
Location, 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 location. Mwah, thank you. Yes, as we've discussed, Ohio occupied an important and unique geographical location in the country. It bordered the south. The butternut regions near the Ohio River shared many things in common with states of the south. And also, while it may have been as populous and as developed as major eastern states, it was at the same time considered to be a Western state, and benefited from the solidarity it shared with other Western states. So as one historian remarked, Ohio, at least culturally, was the southernmost northern state, the northernmost southern state, the westernmost eastern state, and the easternmost western state. Another important factor in this equation is the role Ohio played in the Republican Party. As we've seen, Ohio played a major role in the formation of the Republican Party in the 1850s, supplied some of its most important national leaders, and elections in the late 1800s were extremely close. The average margin of victory from 1876 to 1892 was only 1.4 percent. And while the Democratic Party could count on the solid South to vote Democratic and win elections without Ohio, Ohio was much more important in the calculus of the Republican Party. Starting in the late 1860s and continuing more than 160 years to this very day, no Republican candidate has won the presidency without taking Ohio. Never. Not once. It still is crucially important to the Republican Party and their electoral calculus. So with things on a knife's edge in extremely close elections and with Ohio a potential swing state, it behooved the GOP strategically to choose candidates from Ohio in hopes that by carrying the state, they could also carry the party over the finish line. So with this being the case, this also explains the the so many cabinet members and Supreme Court justices from Ohio because Ohio presidents will appoint Ohio appointees to this office, thus expanding the dynasty further. So... Where does that leave us? Well, for better and sometimes for worse, the Ohio dynasty of presidents actually proved to be pretty important. From overseeing and implementing the 14th and 15th Amendments, to creating the modern U.S. Civil Service, to passing anti-monopoly legislation that is still the law today, to expanding the United States, to overseeing the expansion of the United States as a geopolitical power, the Ohio presidents bridged the period of the post-Civil War era into the beginning of what historians have called the American century of the 1900s, and they played a key role in changing the presidency, changing American politics, and changing the U.S. role in world affairs, which I think you have to admit is not bad for a bunch of beardy guys that no one remembers. Questions? Stretch in the post-war era, we see that it's all essentially Republican. Which is the first Democratic president to like rip Ohio away from the Republican vote? For the uh, Woodrow era? Wilson does that uh, during the Progressive era. Yeah, and then of course uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, does uh, gets uh, elected three times. But does Wilson do it because of a split ticket, though? Yeah. Well, Wilson, the first uh, Wilson election, yes, yeah, a split ticket because uh, Teddy Roosevelt's running as a progressive. But the 1916 election uh, is not split. And, okay. yeah, so. Uh, and it, it significantly, uh, Ohio begins swinging back Republican. As we talked about, uh, uh, Bricker, the governor of Ohio, is the Republican vice presidential nominee in 44. So Ohio actually does swing to the Republican. That's one of the two elections that Ohio does not uh, vote for the winner during this big, long stretch from 1896 to uh, 2016. Other questions? All right, your final projects are due Friday, uh, so don't forget that. Uh, we will meet in our usual room uh, next time. If there are no questions, I'll see you Friday. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.